By the time we reach the Police's Swan Song here, much of the rawness and reggae punk fusion that I love so much about this band was long gone in favor of the much more clean, polished sound that we heard on their previous album. Understanding that going in, I expected to hear their weakest, blandest, and least daring project. Instead, we got one of the best swan songs of all time. What is it your favorite personal swan song? Let us know in the comments. Without further, Bovine Excrement. I'm Darius King. And I'm Metalhead. Synchronicity 1. Often on the show, we angrily shake our fists at the sky on why excellent musical innovation like progressive music is not more popular in the mainstream. Truthfully, I feel like the police have gotten the closest to that in the modern era. Not just with factors like Stuart's mind-bending timing on songs like Murder by the Numbers, which we'll get to, a phenomenal song, but also with sounds like the xylophone that we hear in the beginning of this one. Yeah, they really push the envelope of pop prog. It's fair to label them as a, a pop band, but also one of the best all-time greatest because of the way that they innovated their sound. With Andy taking more <clears throat> Whoa. Oh, man. With Andy taking more of a backseat that gives Stuart plenty of room on this one to be Stuart. But Sting also takes the opportunity to go absolutely wild with the vocal layers here. Not just the harmonies, but the layers on top, like a big wall of Sting. Lyrically, we learn that this book is somehow one of the greatest albums of all time because it also inspired another Pat Metheny track from another great album, Imaginary Day, which you should go listen to as well. Continuing the innovation with experimental sounds and textures, Sting puts you on that Ellen ride from Disney World from a couple years ago. It's not one that I'm going to be blasting in the car anytime soon, but the sounds on here are mesmerizing. Made even more impressive by the fact that Sting wrote this in just a couple of hours, which actually is kind of uh, evident given that he botched their opening line royally, and then went back, tried to fix it, and botched it a second time. This is probably the, my least favorite on the whole album. It's use of different effects. It helps the song as much as it can, but for me, um, this one was probably more on the boring side. But the the live version is way better with the cool parts that Andy and Stuart throw in throughout. Another one that I much prefer, the live version, specifically the live version where Sting has his gay stripper outfit on and Andy <laughs> has the Marty McFly jacket. What an amazing bass tone. The groove and overall atmosphere with the synth is just layered very perfectly in the saxophone. I'm just careful you don't do the Kurt Cobain with that. <laughs> Did you actually just eat that? Yeah. <laughs> and the saxophone was just... Perfect little sprinkle on top of it. Oh. That show, whole show actually was fantastic. Sing was actually a fantastic frontman. For the mostly upbeat tones you get on this record, there's so many dark and negative lyrical themes on here. Rephrasing the Bible to reflect his distaste for mainstream religion. I mean, what else is there to say other than... Uh, I think Primus out of ten. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that Les Claypool was asked to um, record the song. Primus out of ten. Primus out of ten. Primus out of ten. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Ooh, listen to that dissonance. That was like James Hetfield. Ooh, that was, that was yeah. Cool. It's wild how much of a stronghold that Stuart has on these songs. Andy definitely throwing in some creative stuff there, but Andy and Sting come together to create this solid foundation that's mostly the same throughout. Stuart is the one who changes the energy levels. They radically change their sound from album to album, but this one, Stuart puts on a vintage first two album performance. Every time you say Stuart, I just think of he was somebody. Stuart, what's his bad? I can't believe he actually ruined Winger's career. <laughs> Whether or not this was intentional, I'm not sure. The way in which Sting weaved the concept of synchronicity into not just this song, but the whole record just shows the true brilliance of this record and this band. While all of the songs touch on different subjects, like I mentioned earlier, so many of the lyrical themes have this common theme of darkness and depression, which is exactly the concept of synchronicity. Circumstances that appear meaningfully related yet lack a casual connection. That reaches a pinnacle on synchronicity too. The story of a family man who in a variety of different settings, whether that's work, home, or elsewhere, can't seem to find happiness this is always in this mood of depression and despair. By far, one of my absolute favorite riffs from the police in general, the spacing that they put in where he says a verse and then they play a little riff, verse, riff again. Well-crafted, structured song. Hmm. Interesting. I agree. I think lyrically, it is one of the best on the record, but instrumentally, I feel it's one of the more overrated ones. There are, however, some interesting parts sprinkled in, like the quirky synth intro like you were talking about. Some of Andy's progressions were creative, but Stuart is much more dialed back on this one. like yeah. to see him go a little little more ape shit, like usual. And I'm generally not a big fan of Sting's Kermit vocals. It's still a fun and creative track. Definitely one of my favorites. Uh, the next song I gave. Speaking me. of Oops. overrated. Oh, really? No, I'm just kidding. I actually love this one. I believe this was my initial introduction into the actual police. I grew up listening to Sting's solo career. One thing that's undeniable is the incredibly spacey, simultaneously emotional atmosphere. The police did so well on songs like Walking on the Moon. A style I wish they frequented more during their run, but Sting really captured that nicely in a lot of his songs like Fields of Gold. Oh, Fields of Gold. Yeah, man. Obviously, it's impressive when you can play like John Petrucci or write like other people like that but when you can take a simple 
progression and make it into a lovable song. I think that in itself is its own genius. Not only is the vocal performance one of my favorites by Stay because he's not doing the Kermit as much like you. <laughs> the lyrics being a double meaning of like an actual romantic thing and also a stalker, more on the stalker side. Do it. Solid concrete backbone. See, but that's actually what pisses me off that Stuart was the backbone. Stuart being handcuffed for most of the song is really what draws my ire, especially the intro. I understand. I actually like the fact that they told him to let Andy's part breathe in the beginning. But I really would have liked him to just let loose on this one, but I'm pretty sure they, they probably told him something like this is going to be the radio hit, so do the equivalent of Charles Berthoud's uh, pop bass. <laughs> Do you actually mind playing this space right here? Oh. Leading the atmosphere as charge as usual, though, is Andy Summers. You can really hear the impact of Andy's work, too, in a lot of progressive rock, Rush especially. But also, Dream Theater and Tool, you hear a lot of this delay clean sound that I really enjoy. Even though I do feel it's overplayed, I'd say it's, it's not overrated, so I was just messing with you in the yeah. beginning. And this is also really the start of a hot streak in this entire second half of the album. Yeah. This one I give a 10 just for its, its simplicity and genius. 10 out of 10. Wow. Yeah. Uh, not to, to be a letdown, but I give this one a 10. That's still great. It's still pretty great, but I know some of the people have an in the comments. Oh, yeah, that's right. Boy. This is a great one. Mm. Lyrically not my favorite, but Andy's more percussive work with the beautifully accompanied Sting's bass line. And of course, Andy's 32nd notes. James Hetfield picking. And Stuart's odd timing on his intro is something, a little detail that I really appreciate. Yeah. Andy's brief lead is not something you expect to hear from him, but of course he nails it because Andy is the tone god. Easily one of the better vocal melodies. Mm. Short delay effect on Sting's voice really lets it pop. And some of the strongest lyrics on here too is Sting not only calls on mythology, but weaves in some brilliant metaphors to each verse, all to describe relationship struggles. And they once again capture that relaxing vibe. Yeah. And those vibes, I think, are taken to their peak on T in the Sahara. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. With Sting putting down a rock-solid foundation, and he's able to put down such a misty, swelled, ambient chord over the top. That make you feel like you're alone with Squidward. <laughs> This one kind of gave me King Crimson vibes. That's pretty much all the song is, is just that atmospheric. Just sit back and enjoy. With Stuart's soft hi-hat and Sting's bass line, this sounds almost like an acid trip version of Walking on the Moon. <laughs> Beautiful production, too, that just puts an extra exclamation point on it, like little details with Sting fading off into the distance on that last line. This has to be one of my favorites on the album, if not mm -hmm. my favorite on the album. Oh. They really almost left one of the best songs off the album. Really? Now, it never made synchronicity. It wouldn't fit on the album. Yes, the legend himself, Rick Beato, broke this down a couple of years ago, and he pretty much just summarized all my thoughts that I have. I can't think of another pop song that has a chord progression that weird, and also has a chorus as good as this. Such a big jazz influence track here, too. It kind of makes sense that they picked this one to spill off, because the creativity of Andy's chords and the dissonance and the innovation of the progression aren't really something the average person would appreciate. No. And Stewart's just one of his best performances. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think I'll let I'll let Rick break down Stuart's performance. The ultimate cherry on top of what I feel really became an absolutely spectacular second half. After Miss Grudenko, they just turned it up to 11. Oh, yeah. Overall, it's not often that you see a band at this point in their career put the amount of thought and effort into an album that they did on Synchronicity. It's especially rare to see a band at this stage still experiment and innovate at their fifth album, especially given the status that they were as one of the biggest bands in the world at the time. What an album. The structure of each song was so unique and structured very well that every song has its own two legs to stand on its own no one ever sounded like the police afterwards and no one sounded like them before them even the police didn't sound like the police each album offered something brand new and totally innovative it's kind of disappointing that they ended it here but in doing so they solidified their discography as made of titanium everything about this album and the band alone just shows what good chemistry <laughs> does for lineups. It's not my favorite police record. There are not as many tracks that jump out at me as there were on Forgot to the Blank, my favorite police album. But the detail that they inserted into this album, and like I said, the effort, especially as evident by the rock solid second half they put in at this point in their career is too hard to ignore. I know I said I was going to go seal of approval on this yesterday, but I'm going to have to change that one to a playlist. Nice. Also get the playlist for me.